Um, welcome back. Um, and welcome to this panel, which also includes you in this conversation as well, where we're going to just talk, just try and focus forward on where the opportunities are moving forward um, and uh, maybe some, some idea of stretch within that. We're very fortunate to have Cathy Shane with us, uh, who happens to be in town. Cathy is Senior Vice President of the Commonwealth Fund in New York, which is a healthcare system, um, does a healthcare system analysis, commentary, um, uh, encourages uh, health system leadership, many of you know of it. And you would have seen the headlines this morning from their Mirror Mirror um, report, which was not terribly flattering of the Australian healthcare system, but we'll find more about that in a moment. Uh, we also have Jerry Marr, who is the interim CEO of uh, South East Sydney Local Health District. Prior to that, uh, worked in, the, uh, in uh, Dundee, in the east of Scotland, slightly northeast of Scotland. And uh, I will do continuous translation as um, Jerry uh, <laughs> speaks. Susan Pierce, who's uh, the uh, chief nurse, uh, associate professor chief uh, of associate professor Susan Pierce, and, midwif and chief midwifery officer in New South Wales Health. Rowan Hammett, whom you've met. Zoran Bojevic, uh, who is going to give us um, uh, a report back on the session that Ken Whelan was to have chaired and has had to be called away. Nigel Lyons from ACI and uh, Dr. Foley um, makes a return visit. So welcome to our panel. Before we go on, given that you didn't, unless you were roaming around, you didn't get, all get to all the sessions, we'll just get a quick se sense of what at least the chairs of those sessions thought happened, and you can de you can actually decide now whether or not they listened to a word you said. Um, so, Nigel, you were looking at unwarranted clinical variation. You solved the problem, have you? Well, I don't know whether we solved the problem, but we had uh, great presentations uh, from different levels. So, first, John Frederick uh, Levesque from the Bureau of Health Information talked about the uh, mortality reports that they did uh, around uh, mortality from uh, stroke and, and uh, acute myocardial infarct and hip fractures. We then uh, had a presentation from John Worthington, who's the chair. And, sorry, of our... and what was the extent of variation? So what, what was the extent of variation? Uh, significant. Uh, it, it ver there was variation across all of the hospitals in relation to mortality. And when they looked at the funnel plot, there were some outliers, both above and below uh, the statistical uh, parameters. So uh, uh, the, the variation was certainly significant. And if you looked at the, the uh, spread across the peer hospitals, it was quite significant even within peer hospitals. Right. So, so um, we then had a presentation from John Worthington, who's the chair of our ACI Stroke Network, about what the network did with that information and, and the interaction with clinicians and with hospitals across the system. And then we had a, a very good presentation from uh, Leanne Ovington uh, from southern uh, New South Wales about what at a local level was undertaken at Batemans Bay Hospital as a result of that information being provided to the clinician and managers there. And it's resulted in a reduced variation? Yeah, I mean, well, we haven't seen the evidence of the reduced variation yet, but what we did unpack was some of the reasons for the variation. And uh, what was really interesting out of the work that uh, John and the network undertook was that uh, it was interesting when you work with clinicians to assess what's going on, often the perceptions of how care is provided are different to the realities. So when they undertook detailed audits about what was going on with stroke care, even in, order, in, in uh, hospitals where there was a stroke unit or stroke pathways, uh, in some of those places, the systems and the processes and how care was organised, it wasn't always consistently delivered for every patient. So even where the evidence was built into the pathways... So superficially it looked as if the system was in place, but when you dug down it wasn't? Correct. So we have an issue about reliability in the way we deliver care, even where we believe we've got organised care. So it, wasn't, so it wasn't related to whether you had an ornery, uh, uh, a difficult ED physician not giving thrombolysis? No, so it wasn't about clinicians at all, and, and uh, we actually had a discussion around it. it's uh, not necessarily about clinicians here, it's about the systems and the processes of the team and how well care is organised. And the other thing that came out of the discussion is how critical it is to have good information that's provided back to the team about their processes and the outcomes of care. And we believe that's a really critical part of the future if we're going to have sustainability that information being provided to clinical teams and also being provided openly and transparently across the system so people can benchmark how they're, how they're providing care against their peers is really critical. So it's probably a generic template almost for other variation. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mary, you did mental health. Uh, yes, we had a, a really uh, good discussion there. We had very much an on the couch panel session with, with our uh, four panel members and then great participation from the people in the room. 
Uh, we really ended up in a, in a very practical way canvassing the core issues that will be uh, uh, germane to, to uh, our strategic plan for mental health and the emphasis on community-based uh, delivery, working in uh, partnership with other providers and also in, in mental health particularly, the need to, to take into account a whole range of other social determinants of, uh, related to mental health. Uh, and, re and which need to be addressed to get good mental health outcomes. Uh, there was, a, 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 I think, implicit in the, in the discussions and then explicitly towards the end, the real question of, um, uh, of uh, this need to be able to join the dots in the community, to better support those in primary care, um, to be able to handle mental health patients using the more specialist uh, expertise that, that, that sit with the, in our mental health services. We particularly, with uh, Scott and Tristram on the panel, uh, focused on, on um, how you think about it in a, in a rural community. And so there's uh, uh, Scott McLaughlin and Tristram Duncan from Western, Western New South Wales. That's correct. Health District. And, uh, and some of the very innovative things that, that, that they're attempting there. Um, including um, the ability to interact and support with, with other providers and, and particularly general practice. I think uh, Tristan used the idea of that the idea being to augment rather than to, to replace or, or be the primary source of, uh, of care. Uh, um, we also noted that the Garling report, uh, Commissioner Garling, uh, saw the primary problem at the time in 2008 when he delivered his report of a shortage of acute beds, and um, and certainly there was at that uh, at that point. There's subsequently been more beds, but um, the real question was, well, the, the trade-off between those investments. I think uh, I think from our panel, the the response was uh, the, uh, very consistent with the broader themes of the day that that the priority and in investment needs to be in these other spaces. And, the key and that, in fact, that, that, you know, just as we've talked about health systems evolving, um, and the, uh, uh, the, that then if we can get some of these other things right, then we won't need to have those beds necessarily as the solution. Um, and those and were we were key... just getting in, really into that debate when we had to come back for this session. <laughs> You've done good media training, very hard to interrupt. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and the key enabler, those were the key enablers that you elucidated in terms of moving forward? To, you know, facilitating change? Did you identify sort of key points apart from the ones you've just mentioned? Uh, well, some of the key points, we had a very good and detailed discussion on uh, Indigenous mental health, identifying the high suicide rate in, in Indigenous communities, so much higher, and the need um, to actually think about how to design care, the importance of um, having I Indigenous mental health workers in that space and all levels. Uh, Scott was able to talk about the numbers that, that uh, Western New South Wales has in its mental health service of Indigenous uh, staff, but where he'd like it to go, given that 9% of his population are, are Indigenous. Um, and also talked about um, understanding the particular issues uh, that impact mental health in Indigenous communities and, and Indigenous communities' capacity for healing and understand that culture. We had Peter McGeorge out of the New Zealand experience where and able to um, draw the observation, very different history there. Um, and of course, um, uh, with Maori mental health, um, uh, it would seem a, a much more focused and mobilised set of services uh, in, in New Zealand and he drew the comparison coming here to New South Wales within the mental health service he was responsible for here uh, with, with one designated um, Indigenous uh, worker, whereas a sort of an equivalent size service in Wellington uh, had 30. So those sort of you know, numbers were... Um, uh, you yep. know, were you know, quite marked and, and a sense certainly from Scott and Tristram and the journey they've been going on there that the a sense within the district mental health services need to really completely rethink uh, how we go about the delivery of those services with our Indigenous communities. Thanks, Mary. So, Rowan, uh, unsurprisingly, you looked at integrated care and sustainability. Integrated care. So we had, um, we had Jim Gillespie from the Menzies Centre who gave us an, uh, a rundown of seven case studies that have been published by the King's Fund, suggesting that the critical success factors in models around the world for integrated care have been a, a bottom-up approach, 
built on relationships rather than technology or uh, funding or organisational change as uh, a top-down uh, driven exercise. Um, Matt Hanrahan gave us uh, an LHD chief executive perspective which uh, was useful for a number of things. First of all, he reminded us that there's uh, a, a truly original thought a rare thing, that in fact um, Central Coast was... How dare you say that about Matt? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 he reminded us of that, not we weren't reminded of that by Matt. Um, <laughs> Um, Central Coast, in fact, has been employing diabetic nurse educators in general practice since the 1980s, um, investing in integrated care, stepping out into the primary care space. So, so this isn't an original idea. It is perhaps an idea whose time <coughs> has come, and the system is, is clearly embracing it. Um, Matt uh, argued strongly that we need to understand the business models that we're going to be able to apply, because if LHDs are going to invest in integrated <coughs> care, um, for the right reasons to improve patient outcomes, there actually does have to be a sensible business case that allows the dollars to be freed up from other services to invest in those integrated services. So um, yeah, I think in recognition of that, the government has primed the system with some additional investment to facilitate some of that work early on. Angus Ritchie from Sydney um, talked with us specifically about an example of health pathways and how uh, uh, they've been able to work with a very engaged and committed um, clinical group um, that spans primary care and uh, acute care. And indeed, they, there is a real partnership happening between the primary care and the acute care teams. Um, and that indeed there hasn't been any difficulty engaging uh, a sense of willingness amongst the clinical community to in, embark on uh, the health pathways journey as an example of integrated care. There were comments from uh, the participants in the room, and, and like Mary, we really had only started the discussion, um, but they reflected on the crit criticality of the ability to exchange information appropriately across different parts of the system. Um, Greg Stewart was arguing very strongly for a clear narrative that explains to our system what we're trying to achieve here in integrated care. It's not just a matter of defining it, it's defining what, where we're heading and, and how we are going to get there and uh, from a those are all focus. from a population focus. Um, and a very good suggestion from our consumer representative who, <coughs> who argued for us all getting rid of the term discharge from our hospitals, that patients shouldn't be discharged because fundamentally it's the wrong mindset. It's a transfer of care from an acute hospital to a primary care or an aged care facility or back to their home. Um, which I thought was uh, a very useful suggestion. Thanks, Rowan. I thought we could have come up with a more pejorative term for discharge, but I'm glad <laughs> it was um, much more integrative. Zoran, you were talking about um, purchasing sustainable care for patients across the care continuum. Uh, yes, Norman, and uh, we also had a bit of a combination of an international comparative case study and, and a local case study. So uh, to get us started, we. Um, uh, had uh, first uh, Chris Mules from um, uh, Health Partners in Auckland, New Zealand, um, give us a very good overview of uh, the journey that New Zealand has been on uh, since uh, mid, early to mid 1990s with their purchasing model and how that has evolved over the years. Um, they've started off with a very strong sort of purchaser provider split, very highly contestable competitive model. Uh, with very strong underpinning of activity-based funding and those sorts of uh, mechanisms, which has enabled them to very quickly achieve some, some efficiencies and, and uh, I guess, tackle some of the low-hanging fruit, so to say. Then it but plateaus that, out, doesn't it? Sorry? It plateaus out if you're not careful. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. So, but, but, but then with um, uh, a significant policy change in the early 2000s, they've moved uh, to more of um, a, a, a planning and funding model as opposed to purchasing model. And that is akin to UK's <coughs> strategic commissioning. It's a very similar concept where uh, the district health boards um, have um, a, a really quite a strategic long-term view of the health needs of their local uh, population and then uh, design services for that and um, e enable uh, creation of integrated care models uh, um, through, through um, uh, local purchasing. Um, and um, it's been really interesting um, to note a couple of other things from uh, Chris's um, uh, presentation. 
And one is that even though they've been on this journey that has in the end evolved their system back to more of a population-based funding model, uh, it's been absolutely critical for them to go uh, through that very strong and focused um, case mix activity-based funding phase on their journey, which has given them the, 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 the information, the tools, the processes, the awareness, and the sophisticated way of engaging their clinicians. Without that, they, were, they would not have been able to move forward uh, uh, into, into more of an integrated uh, planning and funding model. Then we had a great presentation um, from uh, Hunter New England. We had a team. Uh, uh, Michael De Rienza, Chief Exec, um, uh, Professor Lynn Frega, Chair of the Board, and uh, Dr. Martin Cohen, who is the Director of uh, Mental Health Services. Uh, uh, really, I would sum up their presentation, uh, my words, in uh, really two, uh, two key themes. The, the, the power of purchasing combined with the power of local relationships. Um, and, and, and the way I understood um, uh, their approach is they're really using uh, the purchasing model, the service agreements uh, that come with that, and the transparency and clarity of that information. And there was some good feedback from the LHD about the service agreements. Thank you, guys. Is that, um, that was that was that a feeling, a deep uh, and meaningful? You know, thank you. That <laughs> there was a that that, that there was uh, that, that that gave them, I guess, a, a framework which enables them to then have conversations within the organisation <clears> in <throat> quite a sophisticated way, cascade. Uh, KPIs and activity objectives all the way down through the organization, including this really interesting uh, um, uh, model, which they call 90-day action plans. Um, so, so that gives really focus for the whole organization, but then enables them to have similar sorts of quality-based conversations with partners outside of the LHD. So having achieved that clarity of what they want to achieve as an organization, then they're using power of local relationships to engage NGOs and have some really critical conversations about uh, what are the areas where the LHD may no longer be perhaps the best provider of services and where they are prepared to partner with community-based organizations to devolve some of those services to them. Thank you very much indeed. Um, if anybody wants to contradict any of that, feel free to come up to the microphone. <laughs> Kathy Chain, um, reading the uh, the, well, at least the media reports of your report, um, you weren't that flat thing about the Australian healthcare system. Uh, it's true we weren't that flattering about the Australian system, but if you looked at the headlines in the United States, you would see that we come in dead last out of 11 countries and are spending anywhere from twice as much to more than twice as much. So you're... It's small comfort, though, to comparing us to comfort. the United States. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's interesting is we, we, you actually, anyone who's in the middle looks quite good because the difference between the leaders and the laggards, top two, bottom two, is huge. But in the middle, there is not a lot. But I would say Australia comes out um, more in the middle rather than toward the top, partly because of some access issues, patients' experience issues, coordination issues. I mean, there's a series. Um, but I see as your title here is sustainability. I, I think part of that is trying to figure out where are the weaknesses and looking at the information you have about where is it clear that something can be improved because you can see someone is getting a better result, whether it's within Australia, so you can say let's aim for that, or within another country and trying to understand what system is underneath that, which is a continuous improvement model rather than a ranking. Um, let me just say one other thing about ranking. We do ranking within the United States around the 50 states, and sometimes ranks improve in one of our states. And when you look closely on what happened, it wasn't that they got better, it's that the others slipped around them. <laughs> <laughs> and so trying to really say, where were we and what we should have internally, where we think we would like to go. And then if others are moving faster, that would be something to be able to look at. So, so some of Australia's slipping was a new country joined our series, Switzerland, that looked quite good on a whole series of metrics. So it wasn't necessarily that compared to three years ago, Australia didn't look as good. So I, I think it's important to be able to see targets as internal targets as well as external targets. And of course, if you look at the Dartmouth Health Atlas in the United States, it's not related to cost. I mean, some of your lowest cost states are performing highest in the United States. That's, 
It's, uh, not, it's not how much you spend, it's how you spend it. That's absolutely true, and that would certainly be across um, the, the, my favorite line several years ago when we first did this, Mirror Mirror was supposed to be, have the United States look in the mirror to see if we're really the fairest of them all. Yeah. And, and one of the UK press said, money clearly doesn't buy you love. <laughs> With, with people's experience and looking at where was the negative experience that we knew we could fix, um, where are some of it, it's clinical systems that's worldwide a challenge. So the issues of how do we integrate across silos of care, how do we bring mental health, the head back into the body and have people thinking about the, pa the whole patient rather than parts of the patient. In an era where information systems are much cheaper and we don't know yet how much cheaper they'll still be to be able to know things when we need to know them, real-time action. I think there's quite a bit we can do to have productivity gains by using people differently through, because of the information capacity we have. So what are the elements that you've seen internationally which create what you think are the foundations of a sustainable healthcare system with reasonable access? Um, first, I would ask, what exactly do people mean by sustainable? Um, so let me just try to qual qualify that in my own mind, is that for any dollar you spend, you're getting the most you can out of that dollar, and if anything, you'd like more the following year in terms of good outcomes, good experiences, because healthcare is a valued good. So whether you're spending 9% or 10% of the national product, if you're getting more for it, that might be sustainable, but you wouldn't want to spend it and get nothing more for it. But what I think we've seen is that um, thinking of all of these care systems as learning systems and bringing them back together with a full continuum of care, there's an amazing amount of waste in the system that we don't even recognize till we can set a target and ask how could we achieve that better. One hospital leader told me that every time she involves the rank and file, the janitors, the nurses' aides, and say, could we run this clinic in a better way, the ideas that percolate up that no one had thought of and they implement, they take another 10% out, including how long does it take me to walk down that stairway searching for someone rather than be able to contact them, just wasted steps. So there is this sense that we have never really thought of changing the way we operate our care systems Secondly, recognizing that the way we pay for that care may stop people from doing what they could see as possible, that we could empty these hospital beds if we could do better in primary care to act earlier, but we can't shift that money until we do better in primary care, but could we do it simultaneously and what puts an incentive in place? Uh, so this whole idea of transition versus a discharge is starting to be a word many care systems are worrying about. There are too many people coming back when maybe they shouldn't have been in the hospital in the first place, but getting them back in 30 days, we could have thought of a better transition to the next place. So that is definitely this continuum of care and to pay in a way that enables and spurs care systems to think that way. I think is what we're seeing internationally and particularly in the United States. We're starting to see real change. So Susan, I mean, when you talk about this sort of, I mean, it's, it's not as if we're not doing some of that stuff and we're talking at the ground level to people about how we improve systems and changing it. But one, and one element of sustainability is, let's say you've made a change in how an outpatient department works. It's often one leader, one person who's got the idea, and then they go off on a long service leave, don't come back, and it's stuffed. You know, and people say, oh, two years ago we had, you know, yeah. how do we sustain change? That's a good question. Um, look, I think that there's no doubt that health professionals broadly contribute significantly to sustainability. Uh, we drive that evidence base around uh, making change through various programs and initiatives that people right at the coalface of our organisations come up with. And there are a multitude of examples of that across New South Wales and, and all over the world. Um, you look at programs like the Clinical Leadership Program, Redesign, Essentials of Care, all of those programs are driven largely by, from a bottom-up approach with staff. And I was really interested in what Jim Gillespie had to say in the integrated uh, care um, presentation immediately before this, and that was that that is critically important. And we know that, that our evidence base 
points to that, that top down isn't the answer. Um, however, it is important from a, a, a top down perspective that there is that guiding hand and leadership um, to enable the staff at um, the grassroots of our organisations to be able to have the ideas and for those to be able to flourish and not ride on the shoulders of one individual. Uh, the other point about... But what hold, on, hold on a second, that's fine to say, mm -hmm. but the reality is it usually is one enthusiastic individual who cares, mm -hmm. who creates the motive for change. There, there might be an enthusiastic individual that's driving it, um, but I think that what we're learning in our system with the way we're approaching things through the various things that we're running through New South Wales is we know that we can't sustain ourselves on that type of model. And so it is about sharing the love and about sharing uh, the, the uh, roles within any program that we conduct. It can't all be about one person. Um, so give me a tangible example, because it's easy to say this stuff, it's hard to actually okay, so, touch and so feel Okay, so a good example uh, that I heard of recently was, uh, for example, in a mental health unit here in, in Sydney where the team, uh, the multidisciplinary team, not just nursing staff, had uh, come up with an idea to create a garden for their um, mental health clients within that service. Uh, now, that may, may seem like a, a simple proposition, but this was a unit that was uh, fairly you know, aesthetically unpleasing to look at. Uh, there was no room for, for the patients to go, and there were a lot of aggressive, aggressive incidents in that particular unit. Uh, in the creation of, of the sensory garden, they actually reduced their aggressive incidents dramatically uh, by hundreds and hundreds of percentage points. They reduced staff sick leave by 70%. Uh, there were a, a range of things that came out of that that will last in that system because of the way they went about doing that work. But the other point that I'd like to make um, in relation to this is that we also, a lot of these ideas aren't original and I agree with, with what was said earlier. Um, 25 years ago in New South Wales we were talking about nurse practitioners. Fifteen years ago, I was sitting at a desk in Broken Hill writing the first submissions for nurse practitioners in New South Wales. And as we live and breathe, nurse practitioners make up less than half a percent of our workforce in, from a nursing perspective in, this, in, a, in the public health system. Great submission then. So now, no, I'm not trying to make a submission. <laughs> My boss is in the room, but I'm not trying to make a submission. Um, look, the point I'm making is that, that we have got people out there in our system right now who are performing great work. We've got a nurse practitioner out in Western New South Wales who probably, as we speak, is doing colposcopies on women in Western New South Wales and, and is actually integrating the care of those women across the public and private domain and doing a fantastic job. My point is, let's get real about this. We have to start to overcome some of our own barriers. And I'm not being nurse-centric in saying that because God knows nurses know how to cling on to things. What I'm saying is we need to all you know, drop some of these barriers if we are to sustain into the future. That's my point. So, Jerry, mm -hmm. you've um, recently washed up on these shores <laughs> and, um, and sort of into the intensive care unit. And, mm -hmm. um, so just give us a perspective from there to here and sustainability moving forward. Yeah, so a lot of similarities, but the fundamental difference is that Scotland's an integrated system, whereas a CEO, I manage the whole system on a population-based uh, formula. So, so um, you shouldn't confuse it with the English NHS? No, no, we, we, we think England has gone entirely the wrong way. We dissociated from England about eight years ago, so we built a very different healthcare system uh, in, in Scotland. The, but the, the issues are the same. And just, so you, didn't have, you don't have primary care trusts, it's all part of the same yes, system? Yes, it's all part of the single system. Uh, and block funded. And the point is that the, most healthcare systems in the world have become very obsessed by the funding mechanisms. Now the interesting thing is that here we are in a socialised medicine system, block funded on a population base, and our ED targets are 95% in four hours, which we achieve. And every person, every citizen of Scotland has a legal right to access to non-urgent treatment in 12 weeks and that's achieved. So that we, we cannot make the direct relationship between the funding model and the, the system. And 
what I've observed is a very challenging, complex funding mechanism that must challenge ministry, it challenges the districts, and I'm sure it challenges the federal government as well. And, and so the two, th but the two things that I observed from where I came from and here is that we are needing to move to scale on two key issues. One is the one you were talking about, which is continuous improvement, and the other is moving to scale on integrated care. And I suppose my controversial observation would be that activity-based funding is necessary, but it's actually um, not the whole answer. There has to be something else there that begins to develop the incentives for integrated care in a, any different way. Such as? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, the thing was called the opportunities. I think that if the federal government define a changed relationship and they abolish um, Medicare locals, that's got to be an opportunity that the, the, the state grasps to redefine the relationship and the incentives between primary and secondary care. Because one of the things I've observed internationally is that most systems are doing what New South Wales is doing. It's, it's still having to drive the juggernaut of hospital care while funding on a pilot basis integrated care. Everyone's doing that. But governments know that by the time they gather the evidence and complete the pilots, then the population demography has moved another 10 to 15 percent. And the pressures in the system are becoming uh, pretty unbearable. So I think a movement to scale on integrated care um, and so, incentivizing the GPs. So what prevents a movement to scale is fear? Yes, often. Um, but also some of the mechanisms around, um, around the funding. So, so how do you know what scale to move to, if you like? Because that's the fear of the bureaucracy is they can see the sense in it, mm -hmm. but they don't know which way to jump if you're going to actually bet the farm on it. Yeah, well, I, I think the evidence is that um, we did an exercise in, uh, back in Scotland where we said that if we, if we do nothing, uh, we don't change the model of care, then by 2030 we will be building another 500-bed hospital, which is preposterous. We wouldn't do it, we wouldn't have the money, we wouldn't have the staff. So that tells me that we have to move to scale on, on chronic disease management, on multimorbidity, and, and, and older people. And I think you can do that by, by being very specific about the incentives you create in the system. So in the, in the opening address today, they talked about diabetes. I'll give that as one example. Um, because we introduced um, quality points into the GP contract in Scotland, then the disease registers in diabetes went to over 90%. We then began to build in reliability on point of care and primary care. And when I, when I say this figure internationally, people are, are quite surprised, but in five years, amputations and diabetes uh, in my district reduced by 40%, wow. which is an extraordinary number. Um, and that, that's an example of moving, taking a disease-specific category and moving to scale and moving to scale relatively quickly. Because you had information, you had quality information uh -huh. feeding back and your people incentivised yeah, for yep, quality. All of those three things were in place. And I think that's the, and that's the opportunity, but it's also the imperative and the challenge for, for New South Wales. And it's much, much tougher here because of the funding so, mechanisms. So if you were to argue then that um, the hospital system here or the New South Wales Ministry of Health would make a serious bid for primary health network, mm -hmm. or primary care networks here, mm -hmm. the response to the primary care sector is when you get into bed with the hospital system, the hospital gets all the, you know, all the covers. Yes, and, and it's, it's a difficult relationship. That was where we started in Scotland, but we, we were set very clear targets on resource transfer. They were monitored by our ministry very, very rigidly. The incentives for me in that system was, I got money for not having people in ED. Mm -hmm. I got money for transferring the care of older people out of our hospitals. We were incentivised, our KPIs were about reducing admissions for over 65s, for reducing admissions for COPDs and improving disease registers to 90% across a whole category of chronic disease management. It's, so I think um, activity-based funding does the necessary thing around creating and releasing the resources tied up in waste and variation in the system. It's a, a very necessary mechanism, but it's not sufficient to actually get the system to move. And I, I would like to see us in New South Wales thinking about the opportunities that the federal government have created, not maybe intentionally from their point of view, to step into that space 
and start to do some really radical thinking. David, do you want to yeah, I, I just, I'm nodding my head because I think that's, we, we're certainly seeing that in pockets of the United States where people are saying there are various doors open now to think differently with some of the funding that's available if we take hold of the funding and use it differently internally. And uh, sometimes these networks are driven by primary care and specialists without the hospital, where the hospital is going to have its beds emptied, not driving it, but they've set up a governing group where they're studying what's going on. And just on the, your point about mental health, the, in, in, in Utah, which is becoming a more integrated one of the systems there, they found one of the biggest risk factors for their diabetics was undetected depression and that they That's couldn't start working on the diabetes mm -hmm. poor outcomes until they worked on the depression, but they were retraining their primary care physicians and their nurses to recognize those and to, to look at the whole patient rather than sending them in different directions. But they, they had a registry and they started looking at comorbidities and figured out how to tackle it. And so, it became, it, your point about losing one liter, everything changes, this, notion of bottom-up as well as top-down enfranchises a new set of leaders. And one can leave and the next is also trained in a way of thinking, a way of approaching a, a project, and because you've, you've changed the way the system operates in a very different way. It's much the way we retooled airplanes to be safer. We just have not thought of a, a care system has pathways and we can make those pathways work differently if everyone in it is bought into a new way of working. So, Rowan, one of the things I've heard anecdotally from some CEOs, and I challenged Nigel on this uh, at another thing a little while ago, was they, they managed to get their ABFs down on a given set of parameters. So they're under budget, they've actually saved money, and the department or the ministry wants to take that money back from them rather than re-incentivize them by putting it back into the system so they can reinvest in more. So the extent to which people, and that's what happens in Victoria, people are allowed to reinvest their savings. So you have really quite health, some quite healthy hospital networks in surplus, investing in capital and doing their own thing. H how committed is the ministry to reinvesting, allowing districts in a, you know, in a devolved system to reinvest their savings rather than being slaves to ABF targets and NWA targets? So that's for me. Thanks a lot. Um, so, well, look, I don't want to well, say you, someone's you telling you... You allocate resources, don't you, uh, yeah, Dr. Hammond? I don't want to say someone's telling you porkies, but um, so uh, districts are allocated a budget at the start of the year, and we've had growth budgets every year for the last three years. Again, we'll have growth budgets next year, and districts and their boards are asked to make decisions about how they spend their money, and we're, you know, so long as they're producing the right outcomes for their patients, we're delighted for them to make the right decisions as they see fit for their local populations. We are strongly committed to that devolved model. Um, I'm unaware of uh, money being taken back from budgets from people who are managing it. In fact, we're directly incentivising those districts that are delivering their NWOWs at lower than the state price. We're funding growth at the full state price. We're not just funding them at their price, we're giving them a bonus. So, so in theory then, the sort of um, globalised budget reinvestment in, say, primary care is eminently possible Absolutely. within the system? Within limits. So, uh, the Just state, tell us the more state, about these limits, So Sarah? the state health system fundamentally doesn't have deep enough pockets to take on the full gamut of primary care. Um, we, at a New South Wales, at a state level, fund 40 2% of the entire health care costs, the entire health care spend in New South Wales. 68% of it comes from Commonwealth, private, NGOs, whatnot. We can't afford to do everything, but we can af afford to do sensible things. So, you know, with the transparency of information that things like the ABF portal give us, um, uh, we can make rational decisions about wanting to invest in things that produce better outcomes, even if they are in spaces that traditionally state hospital systems have stayed away from. So, Susan, we end up in these conversations talking about vertical problem solving. So, Jerry talks about diabetes, you talk about mental health care, 
Um, we were talking about stroke in Nigel session on clinical variation. So we've got these vertical changes, isolated examples of change. Where does the horizontal stuff start to happen? Well, I, I don't think that they are isolated examples of change. I think we've got... I'm sure they're not, but they're still vertical. Yeah. I just had to say that. Um, I think we've got multiple examples of change. Um, I'm not sure that they are all vertical. I think that there is a lot of horizontal change uh, occurring, but it is about joining things up. And one of the things that we talk about a lot in our system, I think is, and I think I know, is about uh, clinician engagement, which is really important, and, and um, we all support that. It has to be a two-way street. And at the end of the day, health managers in our system have a very important role in terms of managing the funds that they have judiciously to support the best possible that care they can for their communities and the patients within them. And in order to have that horizontal conversation, there has to, they are the people who can, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's the answer to everything, but they are often the people who can pull the levers to bring things um, into more a horizontal um, spectrum from my perspective. Nigel, what's your perspective on that? Because you're fun you are funding some, you know, quite a few vertical kind of programs, but eventually you want that to spread across the system. Well, we're actually supporting both. And I, and I think, uh, and if I think about the system, I actually think we are in a, in a really good place here. There are lots of good things that are uh, in place that will enable us to deal with things in the future. I think, you know, just in, in this issue about investing in the capability and skills of people to have the ability to redesign at a local level, uh, to actually know how to tackle that. We've been doing that now for a number of years. We've got lots of people in the system who, who have had that opportunity and have done projects and implement, implemented them. Um, we've actually got people who we're investing with the clinic, clinical leadership uh, and the SETTLE program that uh, HETI is rolling out to provide support for managers and clinicians to take on new ways of leading their organisations and supporting the new ways of doing things. That's an investment that's across as well. I think the investments around better information uh, are across the board. So you better data to manage services, new tools and resources to support clinicians and managers to look at what they're doing differently. So the infrastructure for systems. Infrastructure. The information systems are getting better and we're getting them better linked. Uh, there are a number of key enablers that we are putting in place as well that I think are really important. There is still further opportunity though, I have to say, around you know, getting a better alignment of incentives I think there is there are an opportunity, there's an opportunity there. So just tell me more about that. Well, I think some of the things that Jerry was talking about and how we finance and support the change uh, and having a clear strategy and how we then support that with the appropriate incentives and, and what we purchase and where we purchase it. Uh, and and uh, I think we can create incentives to drive that change further. There is, I think, a need so for that's, a lot. Sorry, just to be, I'm absolutely sure. So at a macro level, what you purchase centrally well, I, I think it's about how it's purchased and where, and giving guidance to people around the signals in the system that enable them to think about what they should do differently at the local level. Because again, the importance of the relationships at the local level. I mean, we heard today about the relationships that have changed at, at the Medicare local and local health district level over the last few years. I'm astounded about the discussions that even in our clinical networks, specialist groups are having around the importance of primary care. Five years ago, that discussion wasn't being had. There have been significant shifts. We shouldn't ignore the fact that a lot of progress has been made. The governance arrangements in New South Wales, the support of organisations like ours, as much as that challenges people sometimes, but there is a lot of investment in what we can do differently and better. But I do think there is an issue about accountability and transparency, and I think we've got to drive that much further than we have. Accountability at all levels of the system. What are we holding people to account for? How do we ensure that they're delivering what they should be delivering, and how does that align up at all levels? It's not just at the district level with the chief executive and the board, but all of the people who are in the management. But of course, better information teams. systems make Absol that absolutely. easier to achieve. But that's what we've got to do with the information systems that feed back to teams as well about how are they travelling and how does that compare with others and holding them to account to improve, but giving them the skills to do that as well. So, Jerry, how, I mean, having got the diabetes program, which really started out of Dundee with Andrew Morris and spread accordingly, was there a spread through the system? Was there a collateral effect that you've got improvement in other areas too, or they were independent? No, they weren't independent. Um, they then started to move into other categories of um, longer term chronic conditions. But even beyond that now, they're now trying to take a much more systems approach to it, not being disease specific. Um, because we've learned that we got the gains in COPD and diabetes, but to really get the major gains, you've got to think of the whole system of care. 
Um, and our observation is that the biggest challenge that's emerging is not just the disease specific, but it's someone talked about the worried well. Mm. Well, I think we should be worrying about the unworried unwell because these are the people that are now presenting into our healthcare systems, often at the hospital level, with comorbidities and advanced chronic disease. And we haven't registered them, we haven't anticipated their, their needs, we haven't anticipated their needs in primary care. So we've now shifted our programme to unworried and well and trying to improve disease register and begin to manage people uh, within the primary care system uh, in order to reduce the advance of their disease and, and, and not just engage for the first time in an unplanned way within our hospital systems. So here you are running a very big district with uh, you know, big research facilities and a tertiary quaternary hospital you know, and, and several and hospitals that come close to that as well within the network. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you can achieve anything like it within the Australian system? Yes, um, because I think, I go back to your own comments, it's not just about funding, it's actually about relationships and, and how you build systems of care. How do you define the relationship between primary physicians and secondary care physicians? Are, are secondary care physicians prepared to come out with the walls of their hospital? Well, the answer is yes, they're doing that in New South Wales. And similarly, GPs are moving into the hospital system to work very collaboratively. So I think there's a lot of work that you can do in redesigning through clinical engagement uh, between the relationship between primary and secondary care uh, physicians. Don't know what the rules are, but I wouldn't mind making a bid for a primary care organisation and then I'd be integrated overnight. That would be good. Um, but I'm not sure if that will ever be allowed. <laughs> Are you looking for a, an executive decision right now? Or yeah. and, uh, yes. Shall we workshop it? No, that's why I came today. I thought I might be getting an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're going to get it, Jimmy. Um, the final word from you, Cathy, just in terms of moving forward. Um, well, I do think um, visiting and seeing models that look different because they started in a different place is often helpful for saying, where can you move next? So uh, our plea in, at the Commonwealth Fund and what we've been trying to do is find examples internationally as well in the United States. So one place we are all looking to at the US or several places are our more integrated care systems because they're using people so differently on this, this notion of not one disease at a time, but taking my entire population and putting them into risk buckets saying, pretty low risk, we want to keep them there, we don't want them moving up, moderate, and thinking about the resources at each level. So a visit is not the same as another visit for a sick complex, but they've retooled everything. They're using dermatology text the way the rest of the world uses a dermatologist because they can do something to retrain that person in a radiology tech, so not just the nurse practitioners, but, but using a team approach. So it's not each person by themselves. And I think you can learn a lot because it's never thought of working that way before. And we've had people visit that and come back and say, we're in a different spot, but we could do some of what they're doing. And then five years from now, we could be there and, and getting that vision on what is a Scotland doing, but what is this group doing that are getting such good results without apparently spending a lot more. I can feel another submission from Susan Pierce coming yeah. on. <laughs> no, and it is visiting. I mean, we, I, I give talks in the United States a lot, and people, everyone thinks we're either the best or we're so different. And two physicians stood up when I was giving a talk from a southern state when I was describing something in rural Pennsylvania. When another person said, oh, but that's rural Pennsylvania, they said, oh, no, we went and we visited. We were talking to the clinicians and we were talking to the nurses and everyone on our staff got really excited. And now we're back home and saying, what parts of that can we do this year and next year? So it wasn't a foreign country within the United States, but they did feel like, how could that be? But they brought that back on as a different way of working that they hadn't seen before, but they wanted to because they thought they would like their jobs better. Without the Amish population. Please thank yeah. our panel.